Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Joe Patty and today we're talking about Excel 365 introduction. Excel 365 is the latest version of Microsoft's popular spreadsheet program. And this training will teach you the basics of Excel 365 so you can start using it effectively for tasks like data analysis, reporting, budgeting, and more. By the end of this training, you'll be able to navigate and understand the Excel interface, enter and edit data, write formulas and use basic functions, and also print spreadsheets and set up print settings. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnitanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. If you're wondering what Excel 365 is, well, it's still Excel, but it's a subscription-based version of Excel and it comes with Microsoft 365 cloud services. Unlike previous versions of Excel, Excel 365 allows for auto saves and also backs up your work to the cloud to prevent data loss. Not only this, but it also allows for more collaboration. You can do real-time co-collaborating with your colleagues, and this helps to facilitate better teamwork. You can see each other's changes instantaneously. Not only this, but 365 also provides access to your spreadsheet across many devices, including your mobile device. Now, of course, there are protections and security measures that can be involved in this. You have more control over accessing your files than ever, but you still have that secured feeling. The last thing that 365 is really good at is offering a way to stay up to date. Now, with previous versions, we would have to wait till the next version came out to get new features. But with 365, they will send the updates straight to your device. That way, you're always up to date on the new and improved features that Excel has to offer. We're going to start off by taking a look at Excel 365's interface. You'll notice I have my little shortcut right here, and I'm just going to give that a click. Now, if you don't have the shortcut here, no worries. You can find it in your Start menu, and then it'll be under the E section. I'm going to double click on Excel, and it's going to open up my 365 version, which brings me right away what's known as the Startup page. Now, I really do like the Startup page because it allows for me to quickly open up a blank workbook, or I can use any of these templates that I've pre created, or any of Microsoft's templates that they've created for me. I can also see the most recent files that I've been working on, so I can jump right back into working on it. We're gonna keep it simple for today and just simply go to the blank workbook. This is gonna bring us into our main interface. And as you can see up top, we have our quick access toolbar, which we can customize. You will notice that Microsoft 365 does have an auto save feature. And that's that feature I was talking about before and what is 365 where if we turn it on, it will connect to our cloud, which is an online storage system. Typically, it's our OneDrive. And we don't have to worry about hitting save every single time. Anything we do in this workbook will actually save automatically, which is great. We can also quickly rename the notebook by coming up here and clicking on book one and then saving it right away. So that's another new way to save. And we'll be talking more about saving and sharing our files in a later section. We do also have here our ribbon. And inside of our ribbon, well, of course, we have our tabs, our home tab, our insert tab. And inside of our tabs, we have command groups. And inside of those command groups, well, we have commands. And that's how I'll be directing you throughout these videos. I'll say something like, hey, everyone, let's go to the home tab. Let's head over to the alignment command group and let's click on wrap text. That way you always know where I am and you can follow along with me throughout this entire session. Besides the ribbon, we also have what's known as the main box. 
And this name box allows for us to see exactly what cell we're in, or we can even do named ranges, something that we'll learn about in another episode. Now you'll see here that if I click into the A1, I know exactly where I am. Column A, row 1. And that's known as a reference. So you can always know exactly what cell you're on by just clicking on a cell and saying, oh, I'm in column D, row 7. So it's always going to reference the column first, which is alphabetical, and the row second, which is, well, numeric. And it's very similar to if you've ever played Battleships. So you'll see here that we have D7 because I'm selected on D7. Right next to the name box, we have what's known as the formula bar. And the formula bar allows us to see the truest value of a cell. Now you might be wondering, Joe, what does that exactly mean? Well, let's say that I click on a cell and I put a one. And I click on another cell and I put a formula, one plus zero. Well, they both look identical. This looks like a 1, and this looks like a 1, but they're actually different. One is an actual 1, and the other is a formula. So if I want to know the exact true value, all I have to do is click on it and look in the formula bar. And I'll say, Joe, this is just a 1. You just pressed 1 on your keyboard. And if I click on the other one, it tells me, Joe, this is a formula, 1 plus 0. So even though these two look alike, they're actually very different. So that's why the formula bar is super important. Not only does it allow you to create formulas, functions, and calculations, but it allows for you to see what is actually inside of a cell, kind of like checking under the hood of a car. And I'll just delete those out. Now, besides being able to look at our formula bar or look at our ribbon or the name box, we also have a couple of great tools on the bottom of our interface too. First off, we can see here that we have a sheet. And this sheet is representing how many sheets we have in this workbook. Right now, I only have one sheet and it's called sheet one by default. I can rename this or move it or delete it, but we'll talk about that a little later. We can also add more sheets if we wanted to. Besides being able to add sheets, on our right hand side, we have the ability to zoom. Whether we want to use the negative symbol to zoom out, or the plus symbol to zoom in, or if we want to manually click and drag on this little bar here to zoom in and out. And you'll also see here that we have a percentage as well. So we can choose exactly how much or how little we want to zoom in. Besides being able to do that manually, we can also use a keyboard shortcut. And this keyboard shortcut is going to be the control key plus our mouse wheel. So if you have a mouse wheel, you can use it to scroll up and down to zoom in and out. If you don't have a mouse wheel, you can use your two fingers on the touchpad on your computer or your laptop, and you can simply pinch together to zoom in or pinch out to zoom out. So I'll just use my control key, and you'll see me zooming in with the mouse wheel I have, or zooming out. There's no right or wrongs, it's really up to you on how you decide to zoom. But that's our interface. Take a moment to try this out on your own, explore some of the button options that you have, some of your commands, and when we come back, we're going to get into using our search and help filters. When you first start off in Excel 365, you might be thinking there's a lot of new features. Well, that's okay. There are a ton of new features and they're so amazing and they help us out. But what happens if you don't know what those features do or where they're at? Well, Microsoft gives us a nice way to search for our features using this search bar up top. You'll see here that we can search for recently used actions, like I bolded something or underlined something. I can see suggested actions, like inserting sheet rows or formatting cells, or I can even search for people inside of my worksheets. Not only that, but we can search for file names, and we can also search for other things by using full sentences. Maybe I want to know how do I change the font color. So I could say change font 
color. And you'll see right here, it gives me the best action that I'm looking for, font color. And I can quickly do that. But it also allows me to look at files, find things in the worksheet, or even get more help from Microsoft support. Now, without just using our search, we also have a help tab that's fully dedicated to, well, helping us. So you'll see here that we have this help button, and if you click on it, it'll open up a help pane where you can search for things to get help with, or even watch little video tutorials on Excel's newer features, like collaboration in real time. You can also contact support if you want to. Just click on contact support, it'll open up that pane as well, and we can quickly talk to somebody from Microsoft. We can give them an example of what we need help with and send it out right away. We can give feedback, things that we like, things that we don't like. We can make suggestions about things we want to see in the future updates, or even show trainings where we can search for all different types of video tutorials from Microsoft. They also have a community, Excel blog, where you can really find out a lot about frequently asked questions or new updates or how other people are using 365. So take a moment and take a look at some of these things. You might find yourself here a lot, especially if you're new to Excel. And it really is just a great resource to be able to quickly find new features or ask the community for help. One of the things that you'll constantly be doing in Excel 365 is selecting cells. Whether you're navigating or just trying to select data, it's important to know how to. So I'm going to click here in A1. And if you just want to go over to the right, you can use the right arrow. Or if you want to go left, you can use the left arrow. Or if you want to go down, the down arrow, or up, the up arrow. But there's other ways to do this. To navigate the cells, you can also use the tab key, and the tab key will allow you to go to the right. Shift tab key will allow you to go to the left. The enter key will allow you to go down and shift enter will allow you to go up. And it really depends on where your finger placement is on your keyboard to see which one would be more comfortable for you. But once again, there's no right or wrong. You can also just simply grab the mouse and start clicking around to where you wanna go. But I always find that when I'm writing headers, for instance, if I wanna say name, I then use the tab key. Or I say salary, tab key, date of hire, because the tab key is just right there in a position that is easy for me to access. You'll find your way by just practicing. Whether you use the arrow keys, or whether you use the enter, or shift enter, or tab, or shift tab, you'll be able to become comfortable with the way you navigate your cells. Now when it comes to selecting cells, we see here that we can select one cell at a time. I know it's selected because of that border and that bottom right hand corner square. You can select more than one cell by clicking and dragging, just like that. And you can also select more data as well. For instance, if I have a lot of data, let's say I have a couple of names here, like my cell, maybe Alan, Sammy, Tom. And let's say Faz. Well, if I go to select one, and then I can use Control Shift Down Arrow, it will select everything to the next empty cell. Or if I have data going across, let's say we have a couple of numbers here. And then I use Control Shift Right Arrow it'll select to the right, and then control shift down arrow. This makes selecting cells a lot easier, especially if you have a lot of data. You can also select all of these cells by using control A, and it will select all of the data. So if we take a look at what we've learned so far, we've learned that we can use the left arrow to select data, or we can also use the shift tab key. 
we've seen that we can use the right arrow or we can use just simply the tab key. We can use the down arrow or we can use the enter key or we can use the up arrow or we can do shift and enter. And then we found out that we can use the control key plus shift plus any of the arrow keys, depending on where we want to go, to select massive amounts of data. And if we wanted to just select everything at once, we can always use the control and A key to select all, A for all. So those are all our different ways to select data and also navigate ourselves. Take a moment to practice that, and when we come back, we're going to start entering data and start building a really cool ledger. Excel is used for many different things, whether it be budgeting or data analysis, or even just creating a grocery list. Today, what we're going to do is a fun little exercise where we build our own reports, and we also automate our reports. We're going to actually create a coffee shop. Now, I chose Coffee Shop because, well, my name's Joe, and I really thought of a great title for our coffee shop. It's going to be called Cup of Joe's. I know. Pretty funny. But when we're doing this, I'm not going to only showcase how we can enter in data, but we will be going over cell resizing, being able to delete or replace data, and also calculations, functions, and formulas to automate this budget list or this report. So let's start off in A1. The first thing I'm going to do is put in my title. All you need to do is just simply click on a cell and start typing, and it will enter in that information into the cell. So I'm going to type in Cup of Joe's yearly report. Now you don't have to name it Cup of Joe's. You can name it whatever you like when you're following along, but I'll put Cup of Joe's yearly report, just like that. Now you will notice that yes, this does go over into the B and C column. We're gonna fix that problem in a little bit. But for now, let's just leave it alone and let's go to our next cell, which is gonna be A3. In A3, I wanna to start to create a couple of headers that will actually put in the information and know exactly what information is going in. And that's what a header does for us. It lets us know what data are we looking at. So for A3, I want to put in my items in that column. So I'm going to call it items. I'll press the tab key to go over to the right, and I'll do price. Press the tab key to go over. I'm actually going to leave this one blank. I want to keep my items and my price separate. Tab over. Let's go with quarter one. Let's go with quarter two. And I'm just using QTR.2. I'm just abbreviating. You could write quarter out if you like. Quarter three and quarter four. I think that looks good so far. Now that I have that, I'm going to start naming off some items that I'm going to sell. For instance, maybe we're going to sell some coffee, but we'll call it original coffee because it's Joe's original. After that, we'll sell some espresso. Maybe we'll sell some lattes, do latte, blueberry muffin. Of course, a breakfast sandwich. And let's also go with a croissant. And I think that looks great. So yeah, we have our items. And once again, we do notice that blueberry muffin, breakfast sandwich, they're kind of pushing over into the price column. But let's take a look what's going to happen. Let's all click on B4. And we're going to put in the price for our original coffee, which will be $1.75. So I'll put in 1.75 and press enter. You'll notice that it starts cutting off original coffee. It doesn't actually delete anything if we click back into A4. Remember, the formula bar will tell you the true value that's in there, and original coffee is still in there, but it's just being now cut off from price. 
We're going to fix that by using adjusting columns, but we'll do that in a little bit. Let's keep putting in our prices for now. Our espresso is going to be $2, so I'll put 2.00. And you're going to notice something. When we put in 2.00, it actually changed it to 2, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted 2.00. And it did it again. The reason it's doing this is because of formatting. Formatting means appearance in Excel. So even though I'm putting in 2.00, it's saying, Joe, we're going to put in the simplest appearance because, well, we don't want to take up too much space in your worksheet. Thank you, Excel, but I really don't want you to do that. So we're going to fix this by formatting to how we want to format, whether we want to add those zeros or maybe even make it look more like a price with a dollar symbol. But let's keep putting in the rest of our prices. For our latte, we'll do $3.25. Blueberry muffins will be $1.50. Let's do $3 for a breakfast sandwich. And then for the croissants, we'll do a dollar. Now that we have some of this data in here, let's continue to add some data, except this time we're going to add in all of the numbers for quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. Feel free to speed up the video at this moment if you don't want to follow along with me. But I'll take a moment here to just simply put in the numbers. And I'm just putting in some random numbers here. They don't need to make sense or match, but I'll just put in a couple of numbers and then feel free to follow along. And we'll put in quarter three's numbers as well. And quarter four. And if you feel like you want to follow along with me on the same numbers, it would be a good idea. Once we get over to formulas, functions, calculations, if you want to check your work against mine, you should have the same numbers as me. If you don't mind, you can just write whatever numbers you want. But if you did want to follow along with my exact numbers, feel free to pause the video or speed it up and see those numbers there. Now that we have those numbers, before we get into any type of adjusting or formatting, I want to quickly talk about how we can delete and replace cell data. See, we've now just entered in data, which is great but we can also delete or replace the data. But there is a big difference between deleting data and replacing it. And that comes down to two buttons on our keyboard, backspace and delete. See, what the backspace button will do is backspace allows us to replace data. And the delete button, well, that allows us to delete data exactly the way it sounds. And yeah, you might say, hey, Joe, can't we just use both interchangeably? Well, you could if you're only talking about one cell, but if you're selecting multiple cells, you're going to see what happens. If I just want to change this, right, instead of having 939, I want to change it to something else, I can use backspace. And you'll see my cursor is still blinking, which means it's waiting for me to make the edit. And I can put whatever I want there. Or if I press the delete key, then it just deletes it and there's no right, marker trying to say, hey, do you want to replace this? So my cursor's not blinking. And that's because I deleted data. I didn't say I want to edit it. Now I know that it doesn't make sense when it comes down to only one cell, but watch what happens when we're dealing with multiple cells that are selected. Let's say I select all this data and I decide that I want to replace it or delete it. Well, if I go to replace it and I press backspace, you can only replace one cell at a time. And a lot of people will try to delete it using the backspace and notice that it only deletes the first thing that you've selected. If I have it selected and I press the delete on my keyboard, well, then it's going to delete everything. So the delete key deletes things and the backspace replaces things. And when you have 
many cells selected, you want to be sure to use the delete key. Otherwise, you're only going to backspace the first thing you have selected. I'm going to use Control Z, and Control Z allows you to undo things. So I'm going to use my Control and Z undo. So if you see my numbers magically pop back up, that's just a little keyboard shortcut. You can also use the undo button right on your quick access toolbar. And if you don't have the undo button there, you're more than welcome to click the little drop down and go through and you'll find the undo in that quick access toolbar little menu here. And there you go. So I'm going to use undo to get my numbers back. I want you all to take a moment and try that out on your own. As we were taking a look at building this Cup of Joe's yearly report, we noticed that some of our cells are actually being cut off. And not only that, our pricing on our cells doesn't really look like pricing, and it didn't enter in the way we wanted to because of our format. So we're going to format and also adjust the cell sizes. The first thing we'll do is let's format the price. We're going to talk about formatting a little later in another section, but for now, let's just touch base on what formatting can do for us for pricing. You'll see here that when you enter in, let's say, 1.0 or 1.00 and you press enter, it only puts in a dollar. And the reason it's doing that in a 1 instead of adding the decimal places is because it's giving us the most generic formatting that there is most general default. And if you go to the Home tab, and inside of the Home tab, you'll see here the Number Command Group. This is where we can affect the way the number looks. And you'll also see that general number format I was telling you about. You can add in dollar sign symbols or even other currency types. You can make it look like a percentage, add in a comma if it goes into thousands or even increase or decrease the decimal places. You do have, if you click the drop down, a list of predefined formats that Microsoft created, whether you want it to be looking more like a number, or a currency, or accounting, or maybe a short, a long date, or even a time. So first thing we're gonna do is select what we wanna affect. Select to affect. So you can either click and drag to select, or you can use that keyboard shortcut from before, Control, Shift, Down Arrow. Once you have your data selected, you'll then go over to that little drop down under the Numbers Command Group, and I'm going to choose for it to look more like a currency. And look at that. It now looks more like a pricing. That looks great. But we're not done yet because remember, a lot of our stuff like original coffee, our blueberry muffins, our breakfast, sandwich, all of that's getting cut off by the price. So what I want to do instead is I want to adjust column A because right now these still say what they say, right? Breakfast sandwich is still in there, so I know it's there. But it's just that this column isn't big enough. The border is here and it's cutting it off. So I need to extend this column and make it bigger. To do that, we're going to take our cursor and go right between the A and the B, and you'll see that our cursor changes, changes to double-headed arrows. And at that point, you can just simply click and drag to change the width. I can make it really big, I can make it really small, or if I just simply double-click, it will auto-size it for me. How nice is that? I can auto-adjust it. So if it was squished, I can then double click and auto adjust. Another really cool thing we can do here is let's say that we have a bunch of squished up stuff. By the way, if you ever see pound signs in Excel, don't be nervous. That just simply means it's a number, but it just doesn't fit in the column. So once we have this all squished up, let's say the squishes, I'll squish, it doesn't look good. What we can now do is go over, and you'll see this little right angle between the A and the 1. If you click on that right angle, what it does is it selects every single cell in your worksheet. And I mean every single one, 
all columns, all rows are selected at this point. Now all we have to do is go between any of our columns, A or B, B or C, doesn't matter, and give it a double click. And it will auto adjust every single column for us. How awesome is that? So it saves us a lot of time. So you can either work one column at a time or just auto adjust them all at once. What we're going to be getting into next is calculations, formulas, and functions. And before we actually start applying it to our Cup of Joe's yearly report, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between each. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here, and I'm going to zoom in a little as well, and I'm just going to put in calculations, formulas, and functions. And I'll just adjust those a little bit. Let's put a couple of numbers here. I'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And let's talk about what are calculations versus formulas versus functions. A calculation in Excel is any math that is done in Excel. And typically, when you do a calculation, formula, or function, you'll always start off with an equal sign, the universal sign of mathematics. Now, when we're talking about calculations, we're going to actually use Excel like a calculator. For instance, if I want to see the sum of 1 through 5 here, I'm going to have to press 1 on my keyboard, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5. And then I'll press Enter. And it gives me 15. It works perfectly. The downside to using calculations like this is that, first off, it was slow. And also, it's not dynamic. Dynamic means that if something changes within our data, let's say this 5 turns into a 10, it doesn't update the result. So it's not dynamic. It won't update. Formulas work a little differently than calculations. They still do math in Excel, but they do it based off of cells either a single cell or a range of cells. And once again, we have to start off with our equal sign. If I want to add these up, instead of doing 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, I'm going to say that I want to take this cell, whatever's in it, you just click on it, which is E24, plus the next one, and they even color code them, plus the next cell, and I'm just clicking on it, using my plus key, clicking on the next one, plus key, clicking on the next one. And when I press enter, it gives me 15. Now, once again, doing it this way was pretty slow. But it's a dynamic. If something changes, let's say the 5 changes to a 10, well, look what happens. It actually updates the result. So it is dynamic. And that's one of the best things about formulas is that they are dynamic. If our data changes, it updates automatically for us. Not only are formulas dynamic, but they're really great for when we're doing multiplication. So when we need to multiply something, they're very great when we have to divide. And they're also really awesome when we need to subtract data. So I do like formulas because of this. But then what is a function? Well, a function is actually a pre-created formula that Microsoft made for us so that we can use them. So there are already formulas that are built into Excel. Now you're probably wondering how do you find those? There's two ways. Once again, calculations, formulas, and functions always have to start off with an equal sign. And if you want to use a function, you can just start spelling the function out. For instance, maybe a sum function. I type in an S after the equal sign, and it gives me a list of all the different functions that start with S. Now you can look for functions this way, or you're just more than welcome to go up to the formulas bar. And in the formulas bar, you'll see we have what's known as a function library command group, where we can see all of our functions categorized in different categories, like financial, or logical, or text. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, maybe I'm looking for something with math, and then I can just search through 
And I can say, oh yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. I need to add all the numbers in a range of cells. I need the sum function that will sum up all of my numbers here. So I'm going to click here and I'll do equals sum. And the next thing we need is to open up the parentheses to let it know what are we actually summing up. Now you can either do shift nine to open the parentheses, or what I like to do is once you type out the function name, you can press the tab key, which once again is next to the cue on your keyboard, and that will open up the parentheses for you. I can then choose what I want to add together, all of these by clicking and dragging. If you ever want to move this thing, it's supposed to help you. I personally don't like it sometimes it gets in the way, but it is there to guide you. So you can just click and move it wherever you need to. Now it's saying, okay, Joe, we're going to summarize from where whatever's in E24 through E28. And all I have to do is press enter at this point, and it gives me 15. Now, if I was doing that quicker, I could just do equals, sum, tab key, select all the things I want to add, and press enter. So it's really fast. Not only that, but is it dynamic? Well, if I change this to a 10, it updates. If I change it back, it updates. So it is dynamic. So most of the time in Excel, you're going to be using a lot of formulas and functions. You're rarely going to ever use calculations. It's nice that they offer calculations, but formulas and functions work better. So let's actually delete this out. I'm going to select everything. And if you remember before, we can just press our delete key after we select everything, and it deletes them all. And let's scroll back up. Now that we're back to Joe's yearly report, what we want to do is we want to, let's say we want to find the total items we sold. We see how many we sold each quarter, but how much did we sell total? So I'm going to create another header here called total items sold. In the I column, I'm going to put in also, I want to see, well, how much money did we make? Our total sales. And I think that's good for now. Now, you'll notice that total item sold again is doing that thing, right, where it's going over into the I column. So we know how to fix that now. We can select all our columns and go to the top between any two columns and double click. And it fixes it nice and pretty for us. So now we're going to try to calculate, well, the total item sold. And we can do that by using a function. And the function we're going to use is going to be the sum function. We're going to do equals sum, press the tab key to open up the parentheses, and then we're going to select all of our original coffee values here because we just want to add up how much original coffee did we sell in quarter one, two, and three, and four, and then put the total here. So I'm going to select from D4, click and drag, to G4, and then press enter. Ooh, all right, 3,784. Perfect. But I'm not done here. I want to also do the same thing for espresso, for lattes, for blueberry muffins, breakfast sandwich, and croissants. Now, we could just do equals and then sum and then tab, and then select G5 through G5, and we can do that a bunch more times. But I like to save time. I like to be the most efficient I can be in Excel. I'm going to give you a sneak peek to what's known as the autofill feature. Autofill allows us to copy a pattern, whether it's number pattern or dates, or it could be categorical months, it could be weekdays, or it could be a formula or a function. What we can do is we can select our function. And you'll notice that when you select any cell, we have that little square in the bottom right hand corner. Well, that square is actually known as the autofill handle. 
And that little square allows us to copy the pattern that we're trying to do here. So for instance, if you see the pattern in this one, if you double click into the cell, we can see what formula we're using. It's equal sum D4 to G4. If we double click into this one, equal sum D5 to G5. So D4 to G4, D5 to G5. There's a little bit of a pattern going. And if I click on that little square there, you'll see, look what happens. Just by hovering over, you get the white cross-haired cursor changes to a black cross-haired cursor. If you do a double click, one, two, what? It fills in the rest of it. How amazing is this? So it's following the pattern. D4 to G4. D5 to G5. D6 to G6. You could probably guess the next one, right? D7 to G7. D8 to G8. D9 to G9. So it just followed the pattern all the way down so we didn't have to worry about it. So all we really had to do was one function and then just autofill by clicking and dragging. Or if you have data on both sides, you could just do double click. So if it's on the left side or the right side. We're going to do one more function and then we'll take a look at a couple other basic functions that you can perform. So let's do the total sales. In this one, we're probably not going to use exactly a function for this because if we want to get the total sales, well, that's going to be the price of the original coffee. And we want to multiply by how many original coffees we sold. We sold 3,784 coffees. We charge $1.75 for each of those. So if we multiply it using an asterisk symbol, that should give us our total sales. So we're going to do equals. And this time we'll use a formula. I'm going to say B4, which is the original coffee price, use my asterisk symbol, and multiply it by H4, which is the total original coffees I sold. When I press enter, I get my currency. How awesome is that? And because we're using a formula and we're multiplying this cell, which is a currency, by this cell, Excel knows to make this one a currency too. So it does a little bit of the work for us, which is nice. We know we don't want to have to do that five more times. So I'm going to click into I4, hover over that little square icon, and double click. And it will do the rest for us. All right, we have an awesome looking ledger so far. We're starting to build things using formulas and functions. When we come back, we're going to talk about using simple functions. There's so many functions out there, but there's a couple you can start using right away for data analysis. Things like looking up the total item sold, or maybe we want to see the average item sold, or the minimum item sold, or even the maximum. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. We've just seen how calculations, formulas, and functions can work for us. I want to show you a couple of basic functions that I use all the time to help me analyze my data. Let's say that we want to take a look at a quick analysis that gives us the total items, the average items, the minimum, and the maximum items sold. Let's put that about two under. Let's do column A, row 12. And so let's start off by naming total item sold. Underneath that, we'll do average item sold. We'll do min item sold. And the max item sold. We'll have a nice little report at the bottom. Now, before we continue, I do want everything to align nicely. So I actually want total item sold not only to be in column A, but I want it to go across column B and column C. And I want the same for each of these. I want average items to be this big. And then I want minimum items to be this big and maximum. We can actually achieve this by using a really awesome feature. That feature is going to be found in the Home tab. And inside of the Home tab, you'll go over to the Alignment Command Group. 
and it's known as merge and center. What it does is it merges the columns together on a row level. So for instance, when I select total item sold, I'm going to select not only A12, but I'm going to go to B12 and C12 because I want all of these to merge together to become one. And I'm going to go to Merge and Center, give that a click, and look how nice that looks. And I want to do that for all of them. So I'll select Average Item Sold, Merge and Center, Minimum Item Sold, Merge and Center, and Maximum Item Sold, Merge and Center. Now we can start putting in our functions right underneath quarter one so everything matches and aligns nice and neat. So the first thing is total item sold. Now we already know how to do this one, right? We're going to use the sum function just like we did here in column H where we were trying to find total items sold across the items. We know we sold 3,784 coffees, 2,472 espressos, and so on and so forth. But what I want to do down here is see, well, how many items do we sell per quarter? That's a little different. So to do that, I'm going to do equals, sum, press tab to open up my parentheses, and select from D4 to D9. And when I press enter, it gives me the total items that I sold for quarter one. Now, I don't want to have to do that for quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. So, very similar to the way we used autofill by clicking and dragging down, we can also use autofill across by clicking and dragging across. And look at that, it works perfectly. So, now what we're going to do is take a look at our average item sold. So, the average item sold is going to use an entirely different function. It's known as the average function. So we can do equals and start typing out average and you'll see it in the list. You can either click on it or if it's already highlighted in blue, you can press the tab key to open up the parentheses. Very similar to the sum function, we're just going to select what we want to average. We want to average from D4 to D9. So I just click and drag to select those and press enter. And we now have the average item sold. And of course we can drag and look at that. Now if some of you do get, because sometimes this happens, if some of you do get some decimal places, that's okay because it's averaging it. If you don't like the decimal places, like me personally I don't, Remember, you can select those numbers, go to the Home tab, and inside of that Home tab, go over to the Number Command Group, and just simply decrease the number of decimals you have. You can either increase them or decrease them. I'll just decrease them and get whole numbers. I also want to get the minimum item sold and the maximum. And you've probably guessed what functions I'm going to use. I'm going to use min and max. So same as always, we're going to start off with an equal sign. Type in the function we want. We want min. Press the tab key to open up the parentheses. And select from D4 to D9. And when we press enter, it's going to tell us 118, which makes sense because if we look at this list of numbers here, what's the most minimum number? 118. And then we'll just simply autofill. We'll do the same thing for max. We'll do equals max. Press the tab key to open up the parentheses and select from D4 to D9. Press enter. And we get the maximum number out of that list, which would be 658. And then autofill. 
Now, if you're wondering, Joe, how am I supposed to remember or even find out which formulas or functions to use? There is an amazing resource online. You can just type out all of the Microsoft functions available to me, and it will lead you to Microsoft's page where they have every single function. And they're all laid out with examples, or we actually have every single function, a little short video on it, on our channel here. So feel free to stop this video and go watch a couple of those as well. But as you can see here, we now have a great report. We have our total item sold, our average item sold, and our minimax. We've actually been using autofill for a little bit now. We've used autofill to autofill our function here, and we used autofill to autofill our formulas here, and then we even saw that we can use it going across here as well. But that's not only what autofill does. It doesn't only work with formulas or functions. There's actually more to it. So what we're going to talk about right now is how we can use autofill command to complete a series of values. I'm going to scroll away from our yearly report for a moment and feel free to do the same thing. And let's talk a little bit about what autofill can do for us. See, autofill can work wonderfully by just copying the pattern. But there's a little more to it, too. For instance, if I just type in a 1 here and I go to autofill, it will just repeat that 1 over and over and over again. What we can do instead is right next to it, if I put a 1 and I hold down the control key and I autofill, so I'm going to hold down the control key on my keyboard and then click and drag, instead of just repeating one over and over again, it will actually put it in sequential order, which is great. So if you just do a one and do a regular autofill, it'll repeat the ones. If you hold down the control key and you do autofill, it will do sequential order. We can also follow more patterns in numeric weights. For instance, if I put in a two and then I put in a four and I highlight the two and the four, I'm telling autofill, hey, I want to go by twos, two, four, six, eight. And now if I autofill, it does it for me, two, four, six, eight, ten. You can do that with all of them. Put a three and a six. Highlight both of them. You want to make sure to highlight both. Otherwise, you might go like this and just replace it with threes. You want to highlight both the three and the six and then autofill. We can also use autofill with dates, which is pretty awesome. Let's do a date. I'll say, let's do something like that. And if I double click here, my autofill will put it in sequential order. People do ask me sometimes, Joe, is there a way that we can just repeat the same number? They might be doing like a sign-in sheet or something like that. You can. If you just type it out and you hold the control key and do autofill on a date, it repeats it. We can also use autofill for items. If I type in Joe 1 and then I autofill, it'll go Joe 2, Joe 3, Joe 4. We could have done that with weeks, week one. Or we could have done that with our quarters. So instead of writing out QTR1 and then QTR2, we could have just done this. Pretty awesome. So you have ways to just repeat itemized as well. And then for series of values, we can also do categorical months. We can either do the abbreviation of January and autofill, and you'll see Jan, Feb, March. Or we can do non-abbreviated January. We can also do weekdays, abbreviated, or non-abbreviated. And those are just built into the system. So not only is autofill really awesome when it comes to formulas and functions, we can use it for dates, numeric values, categorical values. 
And I'm going to take a moment just to delete this out and just scroll back up to our yearly report. Now that our Cup of Joe's yearly report is coming together, what we want to do next is come up with some taxes because, well, we have our total sales and now we have to pay the taxes on it. The first thing I'll do is create a header called taxes. And up top, I'm going to create, let's do here, the tax rate. And I'm just putting that in I1. And then for the tax rate itself, we'll put it in J1. Let's do 7.25. And you can actually use the percent symbol by holding down the shift key and pressing five on your keyboard. What we're gonna do is create a formula to just simply take the total sales and we're gonna use our asterisk symbol and multiply it by that tax rate. And that will give us how much we owe in taxes for those sales. So always remember, we use an equal sign for any calculation formula or function. For this formula, I'll take for original coffee, their total sales, that's gonna be I4, and we're gonna multiply it by J1. And when we press enter, that gives us our 480 and 10 cents. Now we know that we've been using autofill and I haven't really discussed this yet, but if you've noticed in all of our autofill, for instance, going back to total item sold, we see here that we did the sum of D4 through G4. So it's just totaling up these four numbers. And then if we went down, it went D5 to G5, D6 to G6, D7 to G7, and so on and so forth. And that's known as relative cell reference. It's relative to the cells before it, and that's what creates the pattern. The problem is that's not going to always work for us when we do autofill. Here's a great example of this. Let's say that I click into J4, and I do that. I4, right, the total sales, multiplied by the tax rate that's in J1. When I press enter, it works perfectly. But if I decide later on that I want to use autofill instead of doing each one by itself, you're going to notice that we do not get exactly what we want. And that's because if we look at these, this one's saying, hey, you're taking I4 times J1. That works beautifully. But the next one is taking I5 times J2. Oh, I see what's happening. It's actually using relative reference. It's following the pattern. I4, J1. I5, J2. I bet the next one's I6, J3. Let's take a look. I6, J3. So it's trying to follow a pattern, but in this case, we don't need a pattern. What we need to do is take each of these and multiply it by the same cell, which is j1 we need the j1 not to move and that's where absolute cell reference is introduced absolute cell reference will lock a cell so it doesn't move when you autofill now how do we create absolute cell reference well let's delete all of that nonsense there get back in and you'll see i4 times j1 absolute cell reference the j1 we can do it two ways we can either use a keyboard shortcut, which comes in handy because I personally don't like doing absolute cell reference, or you can just simply manually input dollar signs. These are known as anchors, but if you look at them, they kind of look like handcuffs. You're pretty much locking up that J1 so it doesn't move. You put a dollar sign always in front of the column and in front of the row. So now we've handcuffed J and 1 or we put the anchors on J and 1. And when we press enter, we get the same result. The only difference now is that when you click and drag, look at that. Because now if we look, it's I4, which is relative, J1, which is absolute. I5, J1, I6, J1. The I column changes because that's a relative reference, but the J column stays the same and the row column, right? The J1 will always stay the same. And then we have I7, J1, I8, J1, I9, J1. But there is a quicker way. 
And I actually like this way because, like I said before, I don't really like putting the dollar signs in. So let's say that we're doing this formula again. So what we're going to do is put in our i4, multiply it by our j1, and this time what we're going to do is we're going to take the j1, and we're going to absolute reference it, but using the keyboard shortcut. And that keyboard shortcut is going to be F4. Now, when I say F4, I don't mean actually clicking on your F key and then clicking on the 4. I actually mean the function 4 key. You'll notice that at the top, you have function keys from F1 to F12. And what I want to do is I want to click on F4. Now, if you are using a laptop, you may need to hold the FN key, which can be found in the bottom left-hand corner next to your control key, and then click on the F4. So I'm just going to put my cursor next to either the J or the 1, wherever you want. And then I'm going to use F4, and you'll see it puts in the dollar signs for me. That's a lot easier than doing them manually. And now I can press Enter. I can click and drag. And there we go. That looks amazing. Now that we've done all this great work on making Cup of Joe's yearly report, the next thing we may want to do is save. Now, as I said before, the great thing about 365 is that it auto saves, but you do have to turn that off. So if you go to the top left hand corner here, you'll see auto save, and you can turn that on. And if you don't see it, always remember you can click the little drop down and you can customize your quick access toolbar and you'll see automatically save there. So you can either remove it or you can use it. Now you can save the old fashioned way by clicking on that purple floppy disk or even using control plus S. But with 365, you don't have to worry about saving if you turn on auto save and you choose whichever cloud storage system you want. You can either sign into OneDrive or you can use the OneDrive that I'm already signed into. And then I'll click X. I can also just simply save or save as this way as well. And what I want to do is just simply save the old-fashioned way. If you did want to try out autosave, you're more than welcome to. Just remember you do have to sign in to your OneDrive. Or if you're already signed into OneDrive, just click on it. So I'm going to click save. And let's call this Cup of Joe's yearly report or you could just call it training with Joe, whatever you like you'll choose a location whether you want to choose your document your OneDrive your desktop and I'm going to put it right here in my desktop here and I'll click save and there we go I've now saved this now anytime I click on that save function or use control s what happens is it will save it to that location under that name, Cup of Joe's Yearly Report. Now, besides being able to save a workbook, we can also share a workbook. And that's something that's huge in 365 because it allows for real time collaboration, which means two or three or even four or five people can be in a workbook at once. This works really great, especially if you're not in the office or maybe you find yourself in a hybrid setting where sometimes you're remote. Or sometimes you're in person. To actually share this, you'll go up to the top right hand corner and you'll see two things comments and share. We're going to talk about comments in our next section, but for now, let's click on share. When you click share, you can either get a quick link to the sheet and then you can take that link and you can choose if they are going to edit this with you or just view it. Or you could click the share to get more options. Whether you want to share this via OneDrive, which is your cloud storage system. Maybe you just simply want to attach a copy instead of this report in an Excel workbook or a PDF. Just note that if you attach it as a copy instead, you will not be able to do that co-collaboration in real time. You can only do that if you actually share this. Now, if I do click share and I link it and I use my OneDrive, it's gonna upload to my OneDrive real quick, make sure it saves a copy. And now it says that there's a link copy and anyone with the link can view this. If I go into my settings, maybe I don't want people to just be able to view this. Maybe I want them to be able to, well, actually work on it with me. So I can change it from just viewing this 
to add it so they can make changes with me. And then I can choose to put an expiration date on this link or even set a password for extra security. Once I'm done, I can click apply and then just simply share the link. As we can see, sharing can be very beneficial in Microsoft 365, especially with code collaboration and real-time editing in the same worksheet at the same time is huge. But what happens if you're not going to be in the same worksheet at the same time, but you're both going to be still working on the same worksheet? Well, there's a way to do that. Comments. Leaving each other's comments when you share a worksheet will allow the other person to know exactly what you want them to do or what was done. You can find comments in the review tab under the comments command group, or you can go to the top right hand corner and you'll see comments here. They both do the same thing. All you have to do is just click into a cell where you want to leave a comment. Maybe I want to talk about original coffee and then maybe we should up the price. I'll click on new comment and I'll open up this little dialog box. What I love about comments is they've come a long way. We can now use app mentions, which are little notification tags. I could say something like, hey, and then app mention anyone from my organization. Maybe I'll app mention my buddy Faz. Hey, at Faz. And then I can even assign Faz something to do. So I'll say assign Faz a task and I'll say, can we please update the pricing? And I can enter that in. Now Faz would get a notification because we're going to grant Faz access and we'll share and notify them that we have something to do. Now you don't always have to have mention somebody. Instead, what you can do is just say, hey, Faz, because I know Faz will just be in this worksheet with me. Then I could say, please change the pricing. Then I'll click send, it'll send it off. And then when Faz comes in here, Faz will see the comments and can reply. Already did. And we can see who wrote the post, who replied to it, and we can even make edits. Or if they actually already did change the price, we can resolve this thread and check mark it and say that Faz actually did this. And then later on, we can also delete it or even reopen it. Now that our yearly report is coming together great, I want to add a little bit more to it. I want to add some notes section where we have the date and the notes. In order to do this, I'm going to have to insert more rows and columns. Now there are rules when it comes to rows and columns. If you're going to insert a column, it's always going to go to the right of wherever you're selected. And when we're inserting a row, it's always going to go above where you're selected. So for instance, if I want to add another row here so that there's not just two rows between this data, in this data, I can do that by clicking on row 12. I'm actually going to click on the 12, and I can right click and I can insert, and it'll insert a row right above. Now I have three rows separating these two data sets. If I want to add, let's say, my notes section to the left of all of this, well, then I'm going to have to select column A because remember, when you select a column, it goes to the left of wherever you're inserting. So I'll select column A, right click, and choose insert. And it inserts one column. But what happens if I want to insert like two or three columns? Well, you're more than welcome to. But I see a lot of people do something like this. Right click, insert. Right click, insert. We've now done the same thing three times, and that could be quite tedious to do. Instead of doing that, there's a better way. I'm now going to select these three columns, right click, and delete it. Instead of just doing one at a time, where we right click and we insert, you can actually insert as many rows or as many columns as you want. You just have to choose how many you want. Let's say I want three columns going to the left. I'm going to select C, B, A. I now have three columns selected. I'll then right click and choose insert. 
And instead of inserting one column, it's going to insert three columns. How great is that? So you can insert as many columns and rows as you want at once. You don't have to just do one at a time. Now that I have this, I'm going to just create a date and a note section. And the note section will probably be a little bigger here, something like that. And I'll zoom out by one. And this is going to look great. So try practicing inserting many rows or inserting many columns. Or if you just need one or two, just insert one or two. Now that we've added our date and note section, you'll notice that our Cup of Joe's yearly report title has been pushed over into column B. And really, I want this title to still be in column A. So to do that, we're going to utilize what's known as cut, copy, and paste. Cut means to move an item. Copy means to copy the item and then move it. And paste means to take whatever you just cut and copy and paste it wherever you want. So we can do this a couple of ways. First off, if you go to the Home tab, this is where you will find Cut, Copy, and Paste in the Clipboard Command Group. You'll see Scissors icon, that means Cut, Copy, and then you'll see Paste. So if I just want to simply use those, I can select Cup of Joe's Yearly Report, click on the scissors to cut it from column B, and you'll see it has a little bit of a border here. And then I can click where I want to paste it and click Paste. And look at that, it moved it immediately. Now, of course, you could just simply use these buttons here, but if you hover over these buttons, you'll notice each one has a keyboard shortcut. Cut is Control X, Copy is Control C, and Paste is Control V. Now, the way that I remember these is if we look at Control and X, just think of X like scissors. That's going to be your cut. Control and C, just think of C as copy. And Control and V, I think of that as paste because it looks like the tip of a glue bottle. So these work really well as well. And if we select, let's say, Cup of Joe's Yearly Report, I use Control X and then Control V. Look at that, it still moves it. If you want to try to copy, you can also use Control C. Control V to paste it. And you'll see it just makes a copy instead of moving it. So you can use those. Or there's a third way. And this is one of my favorite ways. We can copy or paste things or cut or paste things by not using keyboard shortcuts or by using the buttons. You'll notice that when we select a cell, each cell and has a green border around it. And if you take your cursor and you hover over that green border, your cursor is going to change from that white crosshair cursor to a pointer with four arrows. That's indicating that we can now move this by just simply clicking and dragging. And we can click and drag data wherever we want. We just have to hover over that border, wait for that pointer with the four arrows, and then we can click and drag. And that's the same as moving something. Or if we want to make a copy of it instead, we can do the same thing except when we're moving it, hold down the control key, and we can create instant copies. Holding down the control key and clicking and dragging from the border. So you can move massive amounts of data. Maybe I want to move all of this. I can select it all and then just move it over. How cool. So take a moment and try out all those different ways to move or even to copy data. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about how we can take this spreadsheet and make it into a beautiful looking format. Our worksheet is very functional. We see here that we have many formulas, we have many functions in here, and it doesn't look too horrible. The only thing I would say is that I don't like just how black and white it is. 
it's very boring looking. And what I want to do is I want to add formats. Now, if you remember, we did formats before when we were working on the pricing, and we decided we wanted to make it look like a currency. Formatting in Excel simply means we're changing the cell's appearance. So I want to change the cell's appearance. Maybe I want to make this cell look more like a title, Cup of Joe's Yearly Report. Or maybe I want note section to look more like notes. Or maybe I want my headers to look more like headers. It's really up to you. Now, there's two ways that we can do formatting. We could just format the data. For instance, I can come up here to my tax rate and I can go over to my home tab and go to the font command group and find all of my different formatting options. Whether I want to change the font or change the font size or bold it or maybe italicize it or underline it or add a border to it. I can change the font color or even the cell color. I can do whatever I like here. Maybe I want this to be red. So I'll click on the red font color. And you can choose from so many different colors. You'll see if you hover over these colors, it actually gives you a preview of what it will look like. I want the red. Okay, that looks great. But what happens if we don't really know what colors we want to use? Well, the good news is, is that Microsoft pre-created a bunch of styles for us. And those styles are just a combination of all of these different commands here. We can find these styles if we go over to the Home tab, go over to the Styles command group, and you'll see something called Cell Styles. Now, if yours looks a little different than mine, you might see it more looking like this, and you'll see this part. And you can click on the little bottom tab here to get the rest of it. Or if yours does look like mine, you just click the drop down and you'll see everything that they've created. So for the cup of Joe's yearly report, I want that to look more like a title. And if I click on my cell styles, they actually have a title. How awesome is that? And look, it now looks more like a title. And that's exactly what I'll do. I'll use the title style. So I'm going to click on cell styles and choose title. They even have headers. So I'm going to select all my headers here, click on cell styles, and choose heading three. That looks really great. And I like the little blue line that it has. You don't always have to use cell styles, though. You can still use your own technique. So if I want, like, let's say, original coffee, maybe I want all of that to be... Oh, that's a nice blue. I like the blue. It's a blue accent, lighter 60%. So I'll use that one. Or if you do like cell styles, you can use those. They do have a really cool cell style. I'm just going to take a look here. I'm selecting all of this area, and they have a cell style called Notes. It makes it look like a little note section. You can add in some dates if you want. I'll add in like 9, 17, 2023. And remember, we can use that autofill to fill in a series of values. That looks good. Maybe add a note, order extra for holidays. I don't know, I'm making it up. I'll make that a little bigger. We can add in more. Let's say we want to use these cell styles. There's a cell style for input, which means you input the data here, and then it outputs the data. And really, this is our input, because if we change anything here, this whole ledger is now automated because of the formulas and functions we used before. So if I decide to delete all this, then all of this will be affected. How awesome. So anything we put in here will then output here. So let's do that. Let's actually say that I want all of this 
to be the input. And I want all of this to be the output. And then you can choose anything you like down here. Choose your own customization. I'm going to go with a cell style called calculation, but you can use whatever you like. And now look at this. This spreadsheet is colorful. It's really awesome looking. And you can even add logos in here, or if you have a certain company theme that you need to follow, you can use those colors. But I think this looks really great. We now have a fully completed worksheet. And this worksheet is going to work for us for years to come. We can, every single year, just simply wipe out our quarter one through quarter four data, just like that. And now look. The next year we can start putting in our data and it will start to calculate how many total items we sold, the total sales we made, and how much tax we need to pay on it. And if we ever need to change the tax rate, we can go to the top and simply change it and it will update our taxes. So if I put 9.00, how awesome is this? So we now have a fully functional sheet. The thing is, is that right now the pricing that we're looking at is only for 2023. And this yearly report can go on for 2024, 2025, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to just simply rename this sheet one. Now you'll remember from the beginning of the course when we went over the interface, that we automatically get a sheet called sheet one, but we can rename it. There's two ways to rename this sheet. We can either right click on the sheet and choose rename, or an easier way is to just double click on the sheet, one, two, and it'll put it in editing mode. And I'm going to name this sheet 2023. Now that I have that, we can add more sheets. But if we do just add a sheet, it's going to be blank. And that's not what I want. I actually want this exact same sheet. So we need to make a copy of it. And in order to do that, there's two ways. We can either go the long way, which would be right clicking, going to move or copy, choosing the sheet, selecting create a copy, and clicking OK. And yeah, that worked. But once again, that took a lot of steps. Instead, we can actually be quicker. We could just simply select the sheet we want to copy hold down the control key and click and drag it over. Instant copy. Hold down the control key, click and drag it over. Instant copy. How cool is that? Now all we have to do is rename the sheets by double clicking. I'll call this one 2024, 2025, and 2026. We can reorganize these as well. If I want to move 2023, all you have to do is just click and drag it over. So now we have a bunch of sheets dedicated to each year of our data. Now we're not done yet because we do still have a lot of data in 2024, 2025, and 2026. And well, that data just doesn't exist. That's just a copy of the old data. So what we can do is we can clear out not only the data, but also the notes section as well. And I want to do it for all of them at once. Because if we go into 2024 and we want to delete all the data, we'll then have to do that two more times for each other year. Instead, we can actually group the worksheets together. And when you group worksheets together, that allows for you to make multiple changes on the same sheet going across the board. So for instance, if I make any changes to 2024 sheet, it will affect 2025 and 2026. All I have to do is group them. So I'm gonna select 2024, hold down the control key, click on 2025, hold down the control key, click on 2026. And you'll see that it starts to group them together. Once they're grouped, Delete what you don't want. I don't want any of the dates or the notes, so I'll press delete. And I don't want any of the inputs here. And now you can click away from the grouping, 
the 2023 still has all of the data, but if we go to 2024, nothing. 2025, nothing. 2026, nothing. So we affected all the sheets together. It's pretty often that we're going to share this sheet with somebody else. Maybe it's our higher ups, or maybe it's an inventory person, maybe a CEO. And what I need to do is I need to get it ready for them because they don't look at this data like I look at it. I'm looking at everything here, my notes, my items, my pricing, how many items we sold, taxes, tax rate, and even a little report on our averages, our min or max. But maybe my CEO doesn't like this view. Maybe all my CEO wants to see are the items and the total sales. So how do I do that? How do I show them a view without affecting mine? Well, we're going to learn about creating custom views. But before we can learn about custom views, we need to learn about how we can hide rows and columns. To hide a row or a column, it's quite simple. All you have to do is just simply right click on a row and you'll see that you can hide it. Or if I want to right click on a column, I can hide it. And it doesn't delete anything, it just hides it. So you'll see it goes from row 10 to 12, it's hiding 11. Or it'll go from column C to E, hiding column D. Now to unhide it, you would just simply right click and unhide. But I will be honest, sometimes you'll click and you'll click on hide and it doesn't work. And you have to be really specific on where you click and then it'll work. But it does get a little tedious to hide or unhide things. So what I'm going to do here is now that I know a little bit more about hiding or unhiding rows, we will then talk about creating custom views. So for our custom views, I like to always create an original view first. That way I don't have to worry about unhiding anything because as I just showed you, unhiding can be a little tedious. So the first thing we're going to do since we're talking about custom views is go over to the view tab. That's where it's going to live. Now, if you are in the view tab and your custom views is grayed out, it could be because you have your worksheets grouped. If you're grouping worksheets, for instance, if I hold down the control key and I group this, you'll notice that my custom views grays out. You can only create a custom view per worksheet. So you want to be sure that you're not on any groupings and you're back on the 2023 worksheet. Now that you have that, you'll see custom views is available. We're going to click on custom views right now, and it's going to pop up this dialog box where we can add an original view. I always recommend starting with the original view because it allows for you to not have to unhide anything. So when you click on custom view and it pops up this dialog box, you're going to click the add button. Once you click on that add button, you'll then be prompted to name your view. And I'm going to call it original view. And all it's doing is it's taking a snapshot of the way it is right now. And I'll click OK. And now we have an original view. Now we're going to create our CEO's view. Now we remember what I said in the last section. Our CEO just simply wants to do items and price and the total sales. They don't want to see anything else here. Not the tax rate, not the taxes, none of this report, and none of this as well. So I'm going to hide it. I'm going to select A, B, and C. I'm going to right click and I'm going to click hide. Be sure to click hide and not delete. Delete will delete the data and you won't get it back. Hide will just simply hide it. Now that that's hidden, I'll select rows 13, 14, 15, 16, right click and hide. I'll select G H I J K, right click and hide. And I'll select the taxes, right click and column M, hide, and then column one, hide. So now we're only looking at what my CEO likes to look at. Now we can click on custom views. And we're going to add this view by clicking add again. And we're going to call it CEO 
view. And when I click OK, I now have two custom views. If you click on custom views again, we have our original view, which we can now show by clicking on show. It brings back everything. Or if my CEO walks in, I can click and do a CEO view, which only shows what my CEO wants to see. So I no longer have to just hide the data and then unhide the data. With custom views, I can quickly switch between both views that I've created. Cup of Joe's yearly report is pretty much done. The last thing that I may want to do here is click into the review tab and actually review my worksheet. There's some great commands here, whether you want to check spelling, look at a thesaurus, look at some of the workbook statistics like how many cells are filled out, how much data you have, or even check accessibility. You can also use Smart Lookup to look up things you may not know about, or even translate any of your text. At this point, I'm going to check my spelling. Now, before I check my spelling, I'm going to make some Spelling errors here. I'm going to take the E out of items. Let's take the E out of price. And let's also do let's spell. Yeah, let's do latte and see if they pick that up. Now that I have this, I'm going to use my spell check by clicking on spelling. And you'll see right away it pops up this dialog box and says, how do you spell items wrong? So I'll select the suggestion and click change. It'll say, Joe, you spell price wrong. Select the suggestion and click change. It'll say, did you mean latte or lote or latte? So this suggestion is three down, and then I can change. It'll say, Joe, you're great. You're good to go. Yes. And I'll click OK. But sometimes you do have to be a little careful when it comes to spell check. Let's say, for instance, that I spelled sold wrong, and I put soul, and then I go to spell check. It'll still tell me that I'm good to go, even though I spelled sold wrong, because S-O-L-E is in the dictionary. So it's always good, even though spell check is here, to double check your work. So I just like to run through, check, 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 and say, ooh. I'm missing the D from sold. So even though we do have spell check as an option, it's always good to double check. Also, you can go in, let's say I don't know what a croissant is. I can go to Smart Lookup, give it a click, and it will bring up an article on croissants. What is a croissant? It's a buttery, flaky pastry. Or maybe I have croissant in another type of file. It'll pull up all the files where I have croissant. How awesome is this? It'll even give me pictures, how we can pronounce it. So I really do like the tools in the review tab that we have. You can also look up your workbook statistics. End of sheet is M16, that's the last piece of data. Cells with data, 102. Are there any tables? No, there's 34 formulas. It has a lot of great statistics. We're now done with our Cup of Joe's yearly report. And at this point, you may want to either share this report or print this report. If you decide that you want to print the report, you can always go to the File tab. And in the File tab, go to the Print section. Now, once you click on Print, you may notice that not everything is going to fit on the page. So there's a couple of things we can do to change that. Whether we want to change the orientation from portrait to landscape, or if we want to go to scaling, where we can fit everything on one page. And that works well for us. We can now print this either to an actual printer, or you're more than welcome to print it to a PDF. Before we actually print them, I do want to add a couple of things here. Wouldn't it be nice if we can add our company logo to the top here? or maybe what the name of the worksheet is, or even a page number at the bottom. We can do that by going over to our little back arrow, heading back to our original interface here, and then going over 
to our view tab and inside of that view tab we're going to click on page layout this is where we can add a bunch of stuff to our pages whether we want to add some headers or footers maybe over here i want to add and i'll click into the left section and it'll give me options for header and footer and maybe i want to add let's say the sheet name so I'll click on sheet name, and now that will say 2023. And over here, I may want to add a company logo. I can click into the right section, go back to header and footer, and choose picture. Once I click on picture, it will prompt me to either search for a picture or get one from my file, explorer, or even look at my OneDrive, my cloud storage system. I'll click on from a file, and there's me, and I'm just going to choose learn its logo, and click enter. Now if you click away, you'll see how big it is, and well, that's too big for my worksheet. It's not going to look good. I do want to make it a little smaller. If you click into the picture section here, and go back to header and footer, you will notice that we do have picture formatting options. So I can format this picture, which means change the appearance of it, and make it a little smaller. Instead of the scaling being at 100%, I'm going to scale it down to about, let's do 30%. I think that will be good. Once I click on 30%, the width will change too, and I can click OK. And now when I click away, that is perfect. I'm going to go towards the bottom of this as well, so I'll just click and drag down. And I want to add a footer. As you can tell, this is called the header because it's, well, the head of the page. And this is called the footer because it's at the foot of the page. I'm going to add a footer in the middle here. And for this one, I'm going to add the page number. Now that I've added everything that I want, I can go back to the original view. You can click on View and then go to Normal. Once I click on normal, it'll bring me back. Then I can go back to file, print, and look at this. We now have our number, the page name, and our logo. And I think this looks great. We can now print this as a PDF. I'll click the drop down, print to PDF. We'll click print. And then we can choose where we want to print this. I'm going to put it on my desktop and I'll call this Fun with Joe. I'll click Save. And there we go. It is now saved. So I can minimize this, go over to Fun with Joe, and it is now a PDF. This looks great. We may need to fix up a little bit of the Learn It logo, but other than that, we have now printed our Cup of Joe's yearly report. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope you really enjoyed this course and you got a lot out of it. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.